welcome to our listeners. This is Silent Global Podcast, where polyglots from around the world help us unravel the relationship between languages, science and ourselves. My name is Katerina and today I have the pleasure of hosting our guest, Katja Alfred. Katja is a director of the Center for Didactical Design, the German teacher at National Institute of Applied Sciences of Toulouse, And in the past, she worked as an Erasmus Plus project coordinator. A warm welcome to you, Katja. Thank you very much for having me tonight, Katarina. So my first question to you must be, what languages do you actually speak fluently? Okay, so obviously English, as I understand what you're saying. So as I'm German, I'm born in Germany, so I also speak German. I work in France, so I also speak French. And uh, I can manage in Spanish, so I took some Spanish classes also. But usually when I talk, for example, with native speakers for work, they talk in Spanish and I rather answer in another language, don't feel so comfortable with the vocabulary, but still able to listen and to understand. An additional question is what made you to start learning those languages? Obviously English, we learned that in school. And then I wanted to learn French because I thought it was interesting. But at the school where I started, middle school, there was no possibility for me. So I learned Latin. I had to do that. And I didn't like it because it was a you know kind of dead language, as we say. And I, I prefer to learn languages you can communicate with. Then as soon as I could, uh, I started um, learning French. And I really appreciate it, although it's really difficult for the Germans, I guess, for a lot of people to, to speak French. But it also gives you access to the culture. I learned also some Chinese only for six months. And this was only not because I was sure I would never be able to speak Chinese, you know, to really in a conversation, but to have access to the culture to understand um how words are constructed and this is for me the most interesting part maybe in, in languages when talking about to access the culture uh, do you think that people are acting different once they realize you speak their mother language for example in living in france yeah i think so because uh, already the the voice is changing because your physiognomy of uh, of your head is changing when you speak another language you have a lower or higher voice in another language, first of all. And then, of course, you adapt to uh, to how people in this mother tongue speak. So you adapt not only to the language, but also to how people say things. Uh, like the Germans, for example, they are known really to be very direct. Uh, and the French have a very different communication style where you have to Yeah, sometimes you, you don't know exactly what they want to say because they say it like around the corner. So, of course, you have to adapt to that and then you get into that culture. And you better the better you speak the language, the better you can integrate the culture. So, would you actually agree with me if I say that learning a language itself is very different than to start using it with um, mother speakers of that language, that it has a new meaning or new role which you can't learn from book for example yeah i guess so because um it's um you know when i came to france so many years ago i learned french at school but then i couldn't really follow a conversation because uh, there are so many words you never learn at school and uh, you know never really get into it into the subtle meaning of words and and also some some common language they use but they never teach you at school so of course it's very different when you learn a language with a native speaker or if you learn it from books or at school and when you were mentioning that with uh, spanish speakers you don't feel as confident to speak spanish what language do you usually use to speak with them is it english or if they are in France is it French or if they're in German is it German? Yeah, of course the language they are comfortable with too. So usually uh, we have a lot of projects with uh, other universities in South America. So usually it's English uh, that I'm talking to them. But it depends also, you know, if they are, for example, French teachers. Obviously, I will talk for French then. And when working either as uh, the director of the um, innovations. Uh, and didactic design or uh, when working on those Erasmus Plus projects, mm. uh, what was the language you did most work on? 
obviously English because it was really the language everybody spoke and most of uh, for the Erasmus project most of the teachers who cooperated with me in within this project were English teachers so even though they were not native speakers we only had one native speaker who was uh, based in Finland uh, but most of them were English teachers so of course for for all of us it was uh, easiest to speak English And also, as uh, the director of this Innovation and Didactical Design Center, I have a lot of communication with uh, colleagues from other European universities because we belong to a European uh, alliance, ECIU. So, of course, it's so easy uh, to, to speak English, especially if we are a lot of people. If it's only one colleague, like, for example, my uh, colleagues in Spain, they're in Barcelona, <laughs> they would prefer for political reasons to speak French or English maybe, but usually French rather than, for example, speaking uh, Castillon uh, Spanish because it's, uh, it's, it's the language of Madrid and not from Barcelona. They have the Catalan, which, of course, I don't speak. <laughs> How do you feel about the fact that it's, from what you say, at least I understand, it's expected that the conversation goes in the English Yeah, it's a lingua franca, so I think it's it's easiest for everybody. But then, for example, for this Erasmus project, we tried to do all the resources we produced. Maybe have to say that uh, the project was about producing resources for language teachers in engineering schools specifically, because we found out that you have a lot of uh, teaching material out there, but not really a lot of things specifically for engineers. And I think we need to train our engineers for the real professional world. So they need specific vocabulary. And so we always said we would like to have like language neutral material so that uh, a teacher in Italian or French or whatever could easily translate the document and use it. So don't try not to make references to cultural things or, you know things which really belong to one language. And I think it's important to have a multilingual society because if it only comes down to English, a lot of people, you know, if they don't feel comfortable in it, so they won't be able to express themselves as they want to. So if, if uh, when we met with these um, people from different European countries, some of them, like, for example, the, the person who is from the UK, which was then still possible to be in an Erasmus project. He is French, so I talked to him in French. And I can turn around and talk to somebody else in German, like my, my German colleague. And that's really nice because you're always more fine-tuned in a language. You, you, uh, you talk to a native speaker maybe in, in the native language than if you talk only English. There is something which is get, getting lost. Has it ever happened to you to be on the other side that the people were talking together in language that you couldn't understand? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, it happened to me. So it was uh, when I was a student, I was meant to meet my, uh, my, my uh, at that time, boyfriend in Italy. Uh, and so he couldn't come because I don't know why, why. And I was with his friends, the people he knew. Uh, Italian people, and they only speak spoke Italian. And they took me out because they were really nice. And of course, they don't didn't want to let me at home, but I didn't understand a word what they're saying. It was so awful for me just to be there, you know, and, and not to understand a word. So by that time, I decided I have to learn Italian one day. It didn't make it until today, but <laughs> uh, knowing a bit of Spanish and French, I can understand it. But yeah, it, it, it's you feel excluded, of course. Do you think there is any other role of language rather than this, the main role of communicate with others or being included in communication? Yeah, as I said, I think it's it's a vector of of, of culture of um, you know what is important to you and and how do you say things, how do you live things. I think all this expresses uh, through culture of, of for sure, um, and. And it's also what I, I try also to teach some intercultural topics to my students. And I also tell them that uh, pay attention. It's not because you use the same words in different languages that it means the same thing. So um, meaning of words are vehicles for, for cultural topics. And I always state, for example, the word compromise, which is not at all the same thing in Germany as in France. In France, it's... Um, a bad solution for both parties. In Germany, it's a win-win situation. Um, so I think this is, yeah, culture is expressed through the language. 
but not uh, but not only to communicate. But it serves, of course, this uh, this cause too. And um, back in the past, when you were working as a engineer, um, have you experienced uh, any advantage disadvantages of using multiple languages, either on some conferences or when writing the papers or preparing an experiment? Uh, yes, of course, because first of all, you have uh, access to all the literature. If you speak several languages, you can have a look. And it's not the same even if you have a book which is uh, translated into another language. You won't, won't find the same information as if you read it in the, the language it, it was written in. So this, first of all, is having access to that. And also, of course, in conferences, uh, I think it's always easier to get in touch to people if you know at least some of uh, some words or some sentences in their mother tongue. So you can start a conversation and get into contact with people, open it like a bit like an icebreaker, of course, to people which maybe it would have been difficult if you only spoke uh, English. And then I had an experience when I came to France. I was a very young engineer, just finished my studies. And I, I started working in a big company. And um, so they were invited to take part in a, in a group on, in the ministry to work on the new regulation of, uh, on environmental issues in France, which was really a new topic by that time. It was in the, the early 90s. So France was not so into environmental topics. And as I was German, I'm still German, uh, I had access to all the German literature and it was not really often translated or written in English. Quite often the books, etc., were still in German. So for me, it was in a, I had this access to, to all that literature and I could, uh, you know, take that to the French community and tell them about it, making uh, uh, proposals, what we could include in the regulation. So it was for me just great as, you know, I was like 23, I think, to be able to, to have some influence in, on the French regulation, just because, because I knew the language. I wasn't a better expert in that field than my colleagues who were elder, but they couldn't have access to that. And that's a great example why to actually promote the languages in the scientific mm. era or basically in any era, let's say. And... Um, Back to yeah, comparing the languages with some specific uh, yeah terminology, for example, um, was it hard for you to start working in for this French company, knowing that you've been taught things in different languages? <laughs> It's funny because it was not so hard because you know I was never taught. I was working in waste treatment and recycling. Uh, and I was never taught these matters in, uh, in my studies. It was about environmental uh, sciences like hydrology, climatology, and etc. soil science. So I never really learned about this. And I learned, I think, as most of the young engineers, when you come to a company, I learned these words by doing, by doing my job. And I knew a lot more words in French than I did in German afterwards because I, you know, I never heard about it in German. So I had, of course, then afterwards access, as I said, I read the literature, etc. But in the beginning, I knew the words only in French. <laughs> I didn't exist. Sometimes I didn't know what it meant in German, if it was specific. So it was not so hard. And I think that's really the case of a lot of engineers. You need to learn a lot of new terms when you start working in a company which haven't been taught in, uh, in university because it's a real life situations, it's complex situations. And we try to prepare our students for that, but uh, you can't really prepare them to all what they can uh, live through in their professional life. And um, when mentioning the students and working with students, um, how, how do you feel that uh, yeah, the generation of students nowadays feel about the languages, with, for example, all the technology that is there and is helping us to speak or write in a certain language. Mm. Of course, it, it helps. But uh, for my students, at least, you know, the French, they are known of, for not really well speaking uh, foreign languages. But this is a matter of how it is taught in secondary school, primary and secondary school. The French are as good as any other nation in languages if they were taught uh, the right way, maybe. Um, but that's why maybe the, the French are really keen on speaking Uh, languages with other people because now 
not thanks to um, better teachers in uh, primary and secondary school, but uh, thanks to Netflix or whatever series they watch in English, they have uh, much better English skills than they had before. So really, they're really proud and they want to, to exercise, they want to speak to people. So I don't think that um, translating tools will, um, will be so important because for the French um, interaction between people And the human aspect is really important, maybe much more than other more technology oriented um, cultures. If there was any right way how to learn a language, as there probably isn't, um, what would you recommend or what works for you personally when learning a language? Of course, you need some basics, but uh, then quickly. I think it's it's really being immersed in a real life situation and needing the the language to express yourself. I was teaching English in the primary school of my kids because this was when I um, um, I didn't work for for a year, so I said I can teach. Nobody felt like teaching English, and we had a project where we had a kind of Eurovision, but uh, only with uh, primary schools uh, throughout Europe. And then so the, the children had to, to uh, sing a song, record it, put it online, and they voted the Friday before Eurovision for the best song. And they had to comment on the songs of the others. And they learned English because they wanted to say, this is super, or I like this a lot. Uh, they liked, uh, they, they knew all the, the, uh, the numbers from uh, zero to 12 because this was the points we were giving to the different uh, countries. So they learned it because they needed it. And I think this, for me at least, always the best way to learn a language uh, and to introduce then grammar points when you need it and not, you know, learning 50 irregular verbs and then not knowing what it means or forgetting it quickly. It's really for me learning by doing. And I do a lot of projects with my students, with uh, German students, for example, or even students who are also learning German, like from Poland or Lithuania. Because that's, I think, what you, where you learn most. And that's also what they tell me they learn most because they have to speak. There's no other way around it. And um, when you're teaching German at the university, do you have a free choice how to teach? Or are you following a structure but trying to make the lessons as much personalized for the students or is it, as you say, to try to make it the most useful for them, what they might need in life or in the academic background? Mm -hmm. I really have the chance to work here as a language teacher in an engineering school because we are so marginal. You know, we have all the freedom we want to organize our structures of the classes. And so we try to be as close as possible to their needs Uh, in their later professional life. So I don't think German will be really the language they will talk in most when they connect to people abroad. It will be, of course, English. But I know I have a lot of students who um, have to talk German in their professional life uh, to technicians, for example, who don't speak English because they we still have that generation where a lot of Germans have been brought up uh, in the eastern part of the country and speak Russian rather than English, for example. Um, so it's it's I really try to be as close as possible to their needs, and they don't need to to know about you know vocabulary having books, but which are not at all related to their to their to their yeah what they have to talk about later on. So we try to have um, even for first year students uh, try to do projects where we work on. And they learn uh, together with uh, the colleagues in uh, Germany, the other students who learn French, uh, they learn together the vocabulary. They can listen to the native speakers, correct their understanding of words uh, with a native speaker. And they can also uh, be corrected by their partner. And, and it's also much more fun for them. And this is also important, I think, for not only for language learning, for all kind of learning. You have to have fun and you have to have emotions. Otherwise, it won't stay in your head. There's a famous um, a friend, a German uh, neurobiologist, uh, Gerald Hüther. Uh, he's a professor now. He's retired. But he said, you can plant a kind of seed, you know, with the knowledge in the heads of the students. But if you don't water it with emotions, it won't grow. It won't uh, flower. And I think this is really true. It's, it's important that you, you, you link what you learn to some emotion. And this is an 
nice quote. No, do you think if the Latin and uh, lessons back at school were more interesting or there was some other motivation to learn the language that you would enjoy it more or you would be still able to write in yeah. that language? For me, it was important. Of course, I, uh, you know, after having learned Latin, I know now that it was really useful to learn other languages and also to know you know if you are in science you always have latin names etc but for me the motivation to learn a language was always to communicate with people to exchange and and uh, to be able to to dig a bit deeper in into the culture and so for me it was difficult because i knew from the beginning i was i would never be able to talk to somebody uh, in a conversation in latin thinking about the language and personality of someone Do you think you would be a different person not speaking the languages you speak? Yeah, I think so, because uh, speaking different languages and interacting with people in different languages opens your mind. So if you're talking about a growth mindset, uh, it's not always not only linked to languages, of course, but I think it's it's an important part in it because um, you have to adapt to the person you're talking to. You have to adapt to the culture, to the kind of uh, questions you might talk about or not. And so it, it really opens your mind and it, it really makes you more empathetic. And for example, for intercultural topics, to work with people from different cultures, it's, it's so much more important, you know, to, f to feel with the people, to be empathetic. And so I think it really changes your, your, your person, yes, and uh, your character. And so I can say from my side, Uh, now I've been living in Germany for maybe nine months, and as you were saying, yeah, not knowing or not being communicating with um, German native speakers before, I also had the impression that the language is quite strict, and I didn't know if my flatmates are arguing or <laughs> uh, yeah, or having a good time. So I, I could actually imagine that. Yeah, it must be like um, something you learn and stays in you. I had a lot of problems when I first started working as an engineer. You know, sometimes my boss told me, you can't say that, you know, so it's sort of directly criticize somebody, for example. You don't do that in, in France. In Germany, you, you say what you think and it's accepted. But in, in France, it's really considered as rude. So when I started living in France, it, it was really difficult for me in the beginning. But then you... You you try to observe, you try to look at how people act, and then and you adapt. But it's um, I heard a nice lecture the other day about uh, intercultural topics and saying how far do you go when while adapting, living in a foreign country? Um, when do you start betraying your own values? For example, this is not so easy, you know, to not to over adapt sometimes to a culture and to stay still yourself. And and for me, I think it was like. You know, going a bit over 100% in the beginning, even when I lived in Egypt also. And then you come a bit back to your own values and you find a kind of mixture between the different cultures where you find yourself still, because you're still your own personality and you will always stay that because you had your education in a specific country and uh, the uh, how to adapt to, to, to another culture. So it really, I think you have to find your place in that, uh, that new uh, culture. Do you have any uh, other experiences maybe related to the work when living in Egypt? Yeah, it was... Uh, so, of course, we spoke uh, in English, which was not my mother tongue, and it was not the mother tongue of the Egyptians either. And so, um, for me as a German also, it was sometimes really difficult to understand because they had a different uh, management of time also. For me, you know, I always wanted to go further and quicker and um, have getting things done as a, as a good German. And we started always, you know, like at nine or ten, having a coffee and a cigarette, discussing what we are going, we're going to do. Uh, I was working in uh, an institute which was called Desert Institute and working on uh, soil science. And so it was For me, it was not really that I couldn't express myself, that, but um, they had to, to choose how to ask for things without being rude and to intervene too much in that, uh, 
in that um, habits they had, you know, to talk about a lot of things before talking about work also. So this was difficult. And Egyptian, I learned some Egyptian also before I, I went to Egypt because I thought it would be nicer to, to understand at least some sentences. And it helped me quite a lot, you know. I learned, uh, of course, how to buy things, but also I learned a sentence. I can't remember now because it's so long ago, but uh, the sentence was like... Um, Treat me as you would treat your mother. And this is a very common expression in Egyptian. And when people, you know, started, young men started to say, oh, hello, and, you know, uh, to talk to you like this in the street, you said this sentence and, you know, you cut it off immediately because it was for them really well known. And to say that in Egyptian, even if they, of course, saw that I was not Egyptian, was a very drastic mean to, to cut off all um, Uh, tentatives of, uh, you know, getting closer. So this was really useful to learn some of the the, the um, traditional expressions uh, in in Egypt because they like really liked it. And then, you know, in this case, it was just to get rid of these people. But also, if in some conversation you had at least some sentences, people would open up and will, would consider you much more... Uh, if you spoke some, some of the, the sentences in their language, because they saw that you made the effort to learn it. Does it feel the same for you if you meet another German person somewhere far away from Germany, for example, that you feel immediately closer to them? Mm, not necessarily, because I have here, for example, in Toulouse, there are quite a lot of Germans because we have uh, the headquarters of Airbus. So there are a lot of, lot of Germans working here. And no, really for me, I'm, I'm, I'm working in such an uh, international environment. Um, so for me, there's as many nice as uh, <laughs> not so nice people, you know. It's not really speaking German, which gets me closer to them. But I have to admit on a personal area. Uh, so I was married to a French uh, guy for 30 years. And... Then the couple split up and now I'm still in France. I love living in France, but my partner is German now. So maybe you're right sometimes, you know, when you, when you like a person, maybe it will be easier to get into contact when it's the same culture because, you know, we had the same uh, experiences when we were uh, children and uh, young people in Germany before we came to France. It helps, of course. Talking about, about the... Yeah, international communities. Um, have you noticed uh, that uh, students in those international projects, for example, are um, acting differently than they are acting in the classes in their mother language? Yeah, um, the French students, yes. Maybe not uh, from other universities because they're more used to having more international students also. But as in France, we don't have a lot of English classes. We don't have so many international students. Um, so they're, not, they're less used maybe to it. And they're really shy because they have been taught that French are bad in languages. So they don't, uh, you know, they, they don't speak up sometimes. They're really shy. But then you have to encourage them. And when they get a bit more into contact, we did some icebreakers, etc. cetera, um, then they will open up and speak more. But uh, yeah, I think in, in the, the French, for example, they're really uh, different when they talk in English because they don't feel comfortable. Um, the Germans, I think it's not the same. It's... Um, A lot of people are much more used to international exposure, maybe. So they don't, I don't think they change. They're just, uh, you know, as I said, in the culture, like also the Dutch people, you, you say what you think, whatever person is in front of you. <laughs> is there any motivation that you would suggest to uh, make English native speakers to learn other languages that haven't, hasn't been mentioned? so far that haven't been mentioned so obviously it's also the culture also um, um, and I think knowing more languages um, is, is, is really um, has really an influence on how you see the world and if you if you only speak your mother tongue you can't be open really to the world and, and, and be empathetic so we said that already so it's not really new But for me, this would be, be the most important reason. Um, 
you have to make an effort also, but it's so uh, rewarding. I went with my primary school students at the end of this uh, um, project when I left the school. I went to Scotland to see our partners there. Um, and they only speak spoken English. And I think for my students, it was so rewarding to see they were between nine and 10 years old that they couldn't communicate in another, another language and, and uh, understand what the other said. And this is a bit um, sad to see that uh, those uh, students or pupils wouldn't have this experience. Mm, that's a good example. Hopefully uh, it will change and more native speakers will, or native English speakers will start learning foreign languages. Yeah. Mm. But all the experiences you brought up so far are yeah, really great from my perspective, especially as you've been living in multiple countries. So thank you for that. Yeah, um, you're welcome. And I hope that a lot of students would also, you know, I can motivate a lot of my students to go abroad and um, maybe try to get more into the culture of the country when they go there, because usually they stay in this international uh, group of students. But it would be great if they went more deeply into into the culture of the country and they should learn the, the, the language of the country they go to. Like in Sweden, I know they have to learn Swedish, even if all the classes are in English. But I think that's a great idea. Um, maybe then very last question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, do you find that uh, French people are now welcoming foreigners who want to be included in the French society? It's still difficult, but it's it's not that they don't want to include people, but they still still feel so uncomfortable in English sometimes that they don't uh, dare to 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 speak to people. So I know that still a lot of uh, international students have the impression that uh, the French don't look at them, don't talk to them. But this is not because they they don't want to, but they don't dare to. So I know that it's still the experience of a lot of international students uh, to you know. Yeah, not being able to integrate uh, the um, the French community, and they also stick with the international community. But we try to work on that and make a lot of uh, events, like tonight, for example. There is a sign language event, and all students, foreigners, and French are invited to learn some sign language. And I think that's a great idea to come together and to learn some new language together, also. Green, thank you very much for all the answers. Thank you very much. And thank you so much to all our listeners for tuning in to our podcast. We hope you've enjoyed listening as much as we enjoyed creating it. Stay tuned for more episodes coming your way soon. Bye.